so now we're going to look at the female side of things. I don't care for the word female in general, um, especially when used as a noun. However, it, you can't avoid it, really. <laughs> I've been trying. Can't, can't avoid it, I'll be honest. Uh, so I do prefer the word woman, um, but I definitely you don't want to use the word female as a noun. You want to use it as an adjective only, if at all possible. Sometimes it can't be avoided, but generally speaking, actually, you can. I did an entire TED talk that talked about women and men, and I never used the word female. So if we look at this, this is basically page 632 in your lab book. This is a lateral perspective of the female reproductive structures. I wanted to point out right away the perspective of the urinary bladder, which is a more anterior structure here. Sorry, the large intestine, the rectum, the anus, which would be posterior to this. So we're basically, we're looking at the structures in between there. So here we have the uterus. You can see right away that there is a body and a fundus and a cervix. Those are kind of, when you look at the main structure, of the uterus, those are the three main structures. The fundus is the uppermost part, the superior most dome of the uterus, and then there's the body, where typically implantation will happen in the wall of the body. And then there is the cervix down below, which is an important structure, especially late in a pregnancy, when you want to retain the pregnancy as it goes through the fetal stages and the, the basically the fetus becomes heavier and heavier. It becomes important for the cervix to remain closed and, um, and, and basically preventing an early delivery. As you can see, basically at a right angle, honestly, to the uterus is going to be the vaginal passage. So here's your vagina, and here is your uterus. And the uterus tends to tilt forward, and the uterus tends to tilt forward also, but they are at different angles to each other. All right, here we have an anterior perspective. Again, we have the fundus, body, cervix, and here's your vaginal passage. Now this over here, as we mentioned in a previous lab, this is going to be considered the uterine tube, the uterine tube, or also called the fallopian tube. Now the ovaries here, the ovaries are going to be producing an egg about once per month, about one egg per month, depending. <laughs> There's always exceptions to that. But um, one egg per month, one haploid ovum per month. And it is going to be released basically into the interstitium here, honestly. And then you have fingers, though. Fimbriae. Here they are. There's a spelling. Fimbriae are going to basically grab, I don't know if it's grab, but they kind of like sweep it in. They sweep that ovum into the uh, ampulla of the uterine tube. So we have an infundibulum here, and we have an ampulla. Typically, a fertilization event will occur in the ampulla, and then remember that seven days later, implantation will happen as that fertilized egg traverses through the uterine tube. It will actually plant into the wall of the uterus. Sometimes it doesn't quite make it there. So for example, if you have a fertilized egg that only makes it to here by day seven, it might actually implant, unfortunately, in the wall of the uterine tube. This would be called a tubal pregnancy and is quite an issue. It's quite a, a threatening event. Um, typically, a woman would, for example, test positive in a pregnancy test because the HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, HCG, that is released by that fertilized egg can only be, you know, can only be released by a fertilized egg. There's basically... No such thing as a positive pregnancy test unless she's literally taking some kind of a medication or injections that involve HCG, which sometimes happens. So only in those cases can a woman have a false pregnancy test, like a false positive pregnancy test. Anyway, as the fertilized egg releases that HCG, it does appear that the pregnancy is there, that there is a pregnancy. However, in this case, it would very, very unlikely come to term um, because the uterine tube itself is not a place that would accommodate a pregnancy. It's just simply too small. You need a very large, <laughs> a very large lumen such as you find in the uterus. Therefore, the, um, a, a tubal pregnancy can actually be quite dangerous. It could cause a rupture of the uterine tube. It would be extremely painful, so the woman would definitely be going to her physician and, for help 
And then at this point, they would probably take a scan and find that it's a tubal pregnancy. Now, if a woman wants to, you've probably heard of the concept of tying your tubes. It is kind of just what it sounds like. Just as the case of a vasectomy is a slicing of the vas deferens, a tubal ligation is a slicing of the uterine tube. This unfortunately is an inpatient event. Um, unfortunately, it just, I, I don't know if I should qualify it as unfortunately, it just is, it is what it is. For the male reproductive system, a vasectomy is an outpatient situation because the vas, the vas deferens is very close to the surface of the body. It actually only requires a small incision. It's a fairly simple, straightforward procedure and the gentleman can go home within a couple of hours of the procedure. For a woman to undergo a tubal ligation, it is an involved surgery. General anesthesia, I think um, it is a, an involved surgery. It's much more internal. These structures are much more internal. And in the olden days, what they used to do was ligate the tube and then literally put clips on either end. And I think in some cases they still do that, um, basically to keep both ends t um, t uh, clipped. I don't know, too. I don't know how else to say it, to make sure that no eggs are able to get through there. And if you're wondering, yes, the body still produces eggs. The ovary is the main reproductive organ of the female reproductive system. This is what produces that haploid egg, the ovum. It also is the primary structure that produces the estrogens and progesterones. However, um, there are other structures of the body that, of course, produce these things, but this would be your highest proportion of them. So yes, even after a tubal ligation, the ovary continues to put out eggs. They do tend to be you know, placed into the ampulla of the uterine tube, and they will actually back up. Um, the same with the sperm, though. Eggs will back up, but eventually be reabsorbed back into the body. And the same with sperm after a vasectomy. They will kind of back up in the tube, and then they will be, eventually be reabsorbed by the body. All right, in the wall of the uterine of the uterus, we have three layers. We have an endometrium, which we talked about being the implantation structure. The myometrium, as the name suggests, the word myo means, or the root myo means muscle. So the myometrium makes up the bulk of the uterus wall, and it is extremely muscular for a couple of reasons. One of them is to push out, of course, the baby, <laughs> and one of them is actually to help to push out uh, menstrual uh, structure, uh, men the menstrual cycle as well. They can actually, you can actually have something sort of resembling contractions once a month as the, as the, and myometrium contracts and allows for the expulsion of the menstrual product. Um, sometimes this can be extremely un uncomfortable. Um, you talk about, you know, we talk about women having cramps. Sometimes women actually literally have cramps that resemble labor, which is why sometimes cramps are much more heavy than others. Um, but I would say most women have had some level of cramps and can certainly empathize. And, and the gentleman, you're just going to have to believe us. It can hurt. <laughs> it can hurt quite a lot sometimes. Sometimes it's just fine. Sometimes it really, really hurts. Um, and then there is um, a perimetrium is actually continuous with the serous membrane in this region. I would say, I'm just looking at the picture on page 632, all of the structures we're going to be taking a look at here. I think the one thing I wanted to say that's kind of of interest is that cervix is incredibly important to a pregnancy. Um, for example, a woman, my, my sister-in-law has twins. My brother's wife has twins, uh, or gave birth to twins, and therefore she carried twins through her entire pregnancy, of course, in the uterus. And then at about month five, which is, you know, a little over halfway through the pregnancy, they did, they conducted a circ lodge on her cervix, where, which is where they actually sew it shut. <laughs> they sew it shut. The reason for this is that when you carry twins, oftentimes they will be so heavy that they will actually start to push down on the cervix and you could go into very, very early labor. I don't know if you remember this from when we talked about oxytocin, but the oxytocin released from the posterior pituitary lobe will cause those muscular contractions. And what gets the posterior lobe releasing oxytocin is a pressure on the cervix. So unfortunately, it's all due to pressure on the cervix that actually starts labor. 
So when you have two babies, two fetuses inside of the uterus, unfortunately, the pressure on the cervix is just um, extraordinarily higher than just one. And therefore, they will, I don't know if it's a typical procedure, but it depends on the woman, I'm sure on the reproductive structures, but they will do a circlage. They, they sew the cervix shut and that just keeps it closed because effacing or the thinning of the cervix um, is one of the marks of the, of the end of pregnancy when a woman is really, really ready to give birth. So you don't want it thinned too soon. Uh, so a circlage is where you sew the cervix shut. And then for my sister-in-law, when they removed the, cer the circlage at 37 weeks, which is technically a full-term pregnancy, she went into labor the next day. If you've ever heard of a woman having bed rest, like being, being prescribed bed rest, like you must lay down more, like most of the day, you must lay down most of the day. The reason for that, I would guess usually, is because there's too much pressure on her cervix. And simply lying down and taking the pressure off the cervix will um, mitigate the possibility of an early labor, uh, going into labor too early.